The Atheist to Base Patreon Project presents Proof of God Email. Hey, welcome. Uh, I got an email that was titled Proof of God, and I'll get to that, but I figured it was a good time to address a couple different questions that have come in at various times. Um, you can submit your questions as patrons have access to send me questions that they'd like to have addressed, and I'll occasionally do essentially a mailbag, which is kind of what we're doing right now. Uh, the first question comes from someone named Keith, and I will try to summarize this as briefly as possible, but uh, Keith saw one of my clips uh, on the Hangup where we talked about the infamous wedding cake case. And Keith writes, I thought your argument was strong, but would love to hear your thoughts on what I believe is a much more interesting counter-argument for the baker, sort of. In the majority of businesses open to the public, the case made against the baker stands strong. I agree that ideally all businesses open to the public should not be allowed to discriminate against customers based on race, religion, sexual preference, gender identity, etc. However, some businesses, really individuals, produce creative works, and it becomes less clear when a business is discriminating against the requested creative work versus the customer making the request. I think most folks would agree that the artist should not be forced to create something that they do not want to create. In some circumstances, discriminating against the work is indistinguishable from discriminating against the customer. Here's where I kind of disagree, Keith. I think that you can always make a distinction between discriminating against the work and discriminating against the customer. Keith continues, for example, consider a tattoo artist who doesn't want to draw up and then tattoo a religious proclamation, all sinners repent or burn on the arm of a Christian customer. I think most would agree that the tattoo artist should not be obligated to use their skills or sketch this tattoo, uh, this imagery, if they do not wish to. However, discriminating against the request of work and discriminating against the customer for the religious beliefs are now indistinguishable acts from the perspective of the customer of the, tour, of the, of the court. No, actually, uh, that's not the case. So when it comes to the cake, um, the there wasn't a request for a gay cake. There wasn't a request for a cake with a particular message. They asked for a wedding cake. This is something that this person makes. And it's the type of cake that he would have made for any other customer, just he wouldn't make it for these particular customers. If they'd have asked for a gay cake with a pro-gay pro -gay message on it, well, that would be a little bit different. The baker's cake, though, is never an endorsement of the individual's views, feelings, or relationship. If I order a cake that says, best of luck, it shouldn't matter who the cake is for or what they, I'm wishing them luck with. Matter of fact, that shouldn't even be a question that the baker asks. As long as they would make a cake that says best of luck on it, we're done. As a matter of fact, for anything like that, it should be just simple. I want a cake that says best of luck with these designs here. Is that a cake that you would make? And the answer should be yes. And as long as the answer is yes, it doesn't matter whether I'm wanting to send it to my Christian missionary friend who's trying to win over lost souls in Uganda it shouldn't matter if I want to send it to a soldier who's getting ready to go out on deployment, whether or not I agree with the reason for the deployment or whether or not the baker agrees with the, the reason for the deployment doesn't matter at all. None of that applies. If, even if I wanted to send it to like someone charged with murder, hoping that they beat the charges, I'm wishing you best of luck in, your, in, the, in the case against your murder. It doesn't matter if the murderer is guilty. It doesn't matter what the baker thinks about it. The cake maker isn't the one who's saying best of luck. And the cake maker isn't the one who's saying, I support and endorse and encourage your marriage. That's not what cakes are. And if we were asking someone to make that sort of statement, why would we have a business like that? It's like, my marriage is endorsed by Joe's Cakerama. Here's the cake to prove it. I mean, that's, that's absolutely ridiculous. When we go to the Atheist Experience and nonprofits and all those other shows that are produced by the Atheist Experience Network, there's normally a statement there that says the views and opinions expressed by the host are not necessarily those of the atheist community of Austin. That's there not just for legal reasons, it's there because it's true. If I say something on the show, that doesn't mean that I'm expressing an opinion represented by anyone but me. In the past, I've been an official spokesperson for the atheist community of Austin. I am not currently. Nothing I say at this moment should be considered as an official statement on behalf of the ACA. And even when I was the official spokesperson, what I said on the atheist experience wasn't necessarily that, which is why there's a disclaimer there. But we don't need a disclaimer everywhere because nobody in their right mind thinks that a cake maker 
is endorsing or sanctioning a particular wedding. How ridiculous would that be given that 50% plus of them, you know, are going to end up in divorce anyway. So the question is, do you make cakes? Will you make a cake that looks like this? Who it's for shouldn't matter. And in this case, it was very clear that who it was for is all that mattered. So thanks, Keith, but there's your answer. The second email that came in uh, that I want to address, and this is a fairly quick one, and it's old. I apologize. This, this one, for some reason, it was sitting there unread in a folder for ages. <clears throat> Caleb writes, in part, I've been hoping to hear your views on military chaplaincy. I've only been able to find brief comments and videos where you mention your opposition to it, but don't go into much detail about why. Right now, I don't have a very strong opinion either way, aside from my belief that a chaplain is no substitute for a fully trained secular counselor. On that, we agree. I ran into this issue on St. Patrick's Day where I was quite desperate for some mental emotional guidance, but none was available to, available to me at my duty station. Aside from general curiosity, I'm especially interested in your perspective because I've been in conversation with my base chaplain for about two months now, and you may have some opinions that will affect my perspective or at least inform our conversation. Your video has been so helpful for me over the past few years. It's difficult to articulate the ways you've helped guide me to a stronger, more thoughtful, and more confident atheist and human being. So thanks so much for the kind words, Caleb. Uh, my thoughts on the chaplaincy, I've talked about many times, um, and it's a little complicated because I feel that I've answered this in the past, and my apologies if it exists in a video, but at least now I have marked this message unread. I couldn't find it. Chaplains should exist in the military as long as we are deploying voluntary service people away from their church communities. We're, we're asking someone to do a job where they are sent somewhere. And because they consider their spiritual needs an essential part of who they are, and I think any reasonable therapist would say that if it's important to them, that makes it important. And so since we've removed them from that, we're deploying them out there, we have some obligation, some duty to make sure that they have the resources that they need. Now, we shouldn't be jumping through a whole bunch of hoops and we don't need uh, a, a chaplain for every potential uh, religion that's out there because then we'd have one chaplain per person. And that's rather complicated. So the military does about the best that it can, which is to have sort of softball, fuzzy, hey, we're going to be try to be all things to all people sort of uh, chaplains. Personally, I don't feel like these should be paid positions with the military. I think these should be paid for by the churches in the sense of, I also don't think that they should be commissioned officers and, and other things. This needs to be separate in the same way that church and state should remain separate. And uh, the military has been kind of bad at it. And I'm not sure that that they should be in the position of deciding which religions are going to be represented and who's going to get paid for them and all that stuff. There's a lot of potential conflicts of interest. But as long as we have voluntary military, and, and especially if we go beyond voluntary military to uh, draft, now we're forcing people to be in positions and we need to meet their basic needs. But chaplains should be limited in their roles and we should have expert science-based counseling for military members as the primary. If you are looking for bereavement leave, you should never have to request to see the chaplain and have the chaplain approve your bereavement leave. Yes, you should be able to do that and go that route if you prefer to deal with the chaplain. But if you're a non-believer or perhaps as, as maybe you were like me, when I was in the military, I was still a fundamentalist Christian. I did not attend very many church services in the military because the chaplain, the type of church services that went on were awful. They, they, they didn't represent me or my beliefs at all because they tried to be everything to everybody. And I would have much rather had a secular science-based counselor there to talk to when I needed to take bereavement leave or when I needed counseling about certain things. Were there occasions where I might have benefited from or wanted to speak to a chaplain? Yes, but unfortunately, the chaplain service didn't have anybody that I needed that I didn't wanted to talk to. And so I would have gone to an old pastor. Given the modern military, I would argue that um, arranging for people in situations to speak to a 
pastor back home or a person back home, that type of stuff might be more important. And so I would love to see the chaplaincy revamped. Uh, this next one I'm going to actually post on the screen. Uh, I, I have edited it edited this only to hide the person's full name and email address. Uh, this is the one that came in and the title, the subject of it is uh, Proof of God. And so here's the message. It's from Todd. Todd begins, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And then mentions that this is Psalm 53, 1. Obviously for you, Matt, you must have had a bad experience as a Baptist to go from, I used to be a believer, to now berating callers who try to present any kind of truth to you. Well, we're going we're gonna to put that back up in just a moment. But let me point out right away that I hear this a lot, that I must have had some bad experience as a Christian or as a Baptist to go from, I was a believer to now I'm not. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, I know many people who have had bad experiences. I have not. Uh, I didn't have any significant uh, problem. I didn't have anything terrible happen. I never got mad at God. I didn't get mad at the church. Uh, but this is what a lot of people will do when they cannot make sense of why you're no longer a believer. They will pretend that they can read your mind or read your heart because it's in their head it's impossible for them to be wrong. There must, in fact, be a God. And so if you've changed your position, something must have happened to you. And that's simply not true. In my case, this was absolutely an intellectual exercise of trying to demonstrate the truth that a God exists and begging God to answer me and provide help so that I could convince a, uh, a roommate and friend and getting no answer at all. But we'll continue. The Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, James 1.8. You are a perfect example of being tossed to and fro like the waves and never having a foundation built on a rock, i.e. God. That alone is proof enough that there is a God. You, Matt Dillahunty, are the proof. Uh, we'll pause here again because, no, I'm, I'm sorry. That's not the way proof works. Uh, you would need an argument backed by evidence, and what you're essentially saying there is that my mere existence or the fact that I don't believe is somehow proof that there is a God. Um, that's not the way any of this works. And I've addressed it so many times, I don't want to dig into it here. I just want to keep going because uh, it's not going to surprise you. There's no proof in this email. There's not even really an argument much at all. How can someone be so blind and deaf and be given a public forum? Well, first of all, I wasn't given a public forum. Um, I mean, apart from the fact that, you know, a public forum exists and anybody can make use of it. I created a YouTube channel. I participated in a channel, The Atheist Experience, that other people created. But he's, he's saying that I shouldn't be allowed to speak, essentially. And he continues, you are the very definition of an antichrist. Look it up before you dismiss what I'm saying. I'm not going to dismiss what you're saying. I'm fine if you think that I am an antichrist because I am definitely standing in opposition to the figure and the teachings of what you would consider to be Christ. Your fancy words and empty knowledge about saying, give me proof that there is a God, is so ridiculous and rather embarrassing, yet for years you have been allowed, spelled incorrectly, by the God that you do, be do believe exists, he says, which is not true, to pollute and spill out false beliefs. So I don't actually believe that a God exists, but I find it strange that he thinks that I've been allowed um, by God, who I do believe in, according to him, even though I don't, uh, to pollute and spill out false, false beliefs. That seems to me, Todd, to be something you should take up with your God. You, if you're mad that your God has allowed me to say things, then you should take that up with your God, not me. It's not my fault. If, if by your own admission, God is permitting this, then God is who you should be emailing with your you know, uh, venom, uh, not me. The very air that you breathe, he continues, is a gift from God. The heart beating in your chest and the mere fact that you're alive is proof that God exists. Why are you so dead set on spreading hopelessness to the hopeless? Give bread to your listeners, not stones. Um, so I'm not spreading hopelessness to the hopeless. Um, you wouldn't need to spread hopelessness to the hopeless because they already have it. What I'm spreading is skepticism, humanism, rational thought, and actually hope. 
the hope that despite what people claim about us being given over to reprobate minds and uh, just being uh, without hope, uh, I'm actually advocating for the notion that uh, scientific inquiry and understanding are the best ways for us to understand the world and that compassion and, and engaging in humanism are the only ways that we have currently to work together toward a better world. I'm giving people reasons, reasons to believe not in a God, but in a world of opportunity. He continues, I really wanted to rip you to shreds as a person of God, but vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You can laugh and scorn my heavenly father all you want. It's another proof that there is a God because we have the freedom to choose and believe what we want, but that is in no way gives us a free pass. Um, so I'll say this, uh, this person wanted to rip me to shreds, but didn't because the Bible tells them that vengeance is God's. Um, Todd, I'm sorry that you have violent tendencies. I'm glad that you found a way to not enact those violent tendencies. Uh, I'd rather not have you try to rip me to shreds, but I'm concerned about your mental health if you look at someone who says things that you disagree with, um, blame your God for allowing them to do this, but then want to rip that person to shreds for doing this thing that your God allowed. And then when you try to use this as proof that there is a God, first of all, um, this freedom of choice, uh, we don't choose our beliefs at all. Uh, that is not a matter, a simple matter of choice. So you're fundamentally wrong there. Whatsoever a man soweth, he continues, that shall he also reap. Well, then I would hope that I would be reaping reason, evidence, and sound arguments. Unfortunately, I get emails from people like Todd. Todd continues, the Bible which you once believed in is something that you cannot just turn off in your life. Actually, I can. I, I don't pay any attention to what the Bible has to say in my daily life. Just because you're a practicing atheist, I'm not practicing, I got it right. Just because you're a practicing atheist, you are still responsible to God to give account of your life. Uh, I don't see any reason to think I'm accountable to any God uh, to give account of my life or anything else. You can keep asserting these things, but it would be really nice if you'd try and prove it. Uh, so you don't seem to know what proof is. Uh, Philippians 2, 10, 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and that every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Matt, it doesn't matter if you don't believe in any of the scriptures, that doesn't make any of them less true. Well, there I will point out, you, sir, are absolutely correct. Whether or not I believe the scripture is not what determines whether or not they're true. Their truth is determined by whether or not the words and ideas within them are actually consistent with the facts of reality. What I think of them doesn't matter. So you're right. And also I'd point out, Todd, what you think of them doesn't matter e either. You can believe them, whether they're true or not, and I can disbelieve them, whether they're true or not. So now we need to get to what demonstrates that they're true, something that you promised to do in the subject of your email, but you have failed to do at any opportunity. It is appointed for each of us to die once and then to face judgment, Hebrews 9.27. God hates sin and calls all men to repentance. But I need to tell you, Matt, that unless you change your ways and thoughts and lies about what uh, about without tangible proof there is no God, you will and are living in a very dangerous place with God just because you need proof to believe life. Thomas did when the Lord rose from the dead doesn't mean Jesus didn't rise on the third day. God will not be mocked. Um. So once again, he gets something right in that, you know, doubting Thomas doesn't mean that Jesus didn't rise on the third day. And my doubts don't mean that Jesus didn't rise on the third day. But also, Todd's belief that Jesus rose on the third day doesn't mean it happened either. You have to actually present evidence for that. But when he says God will not be mocked, Todd just completely disproved his entire email and case because God absolutely will be mocked. I'll mock God left and right. As a matter of fact, you're writing me, Todd, to complain that God is allowing me to mock him. 
you, you, the whole point of this is that you're mad that I'm willing and able to mock your God, and you suggest that it's God's fault. God is allowing me to mock him. And now later on in your own email, which is supposed to be a proof, you contradict yourself when you say that God will not be mocked. He will absolutely be mocked. Screw God, screw your God, screw every God. If I was even t remotely scared that your God could give me so much as a hangnail, uh, I, I would have to give all this up. This is, this is a nothing burger. But when you say God will not be mocked, that's clearly false. God hates the sinner whose heart is full of anger and bitterness. Uh, I, do, I reject the notion of sin and my heart's not full of anger and bitterness, but which I heard in your voice as you were swearing and taking the Lord's name in vain as a caller was trying to state his viewpoint. Ah, you heard it in my voice. Well, stop reading between the lines. Your pride will be your undoing. God will only allow sin in anyone's life to go on for just so long. Well, um, I'm 52. Um, I've been hosting a show for 16 years, mocking your God, demonstrating my pride and extolling my sin showing everybody what my sin is. Uh, clearly, God doesn't have any interest in stopping me yet, and he doesn't have any interest in coming to your aid and presenting you with reasoned arguments. Todd continues, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2.38. Jesus said, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fast around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea, Matthew 18.6. And fear not them that kill the body, but rather fear him that is able, able to destroy both soul and body Excuse me, in hell, Matthew 10.28. Matt, instead of saying, show me proof that there is a God, you should be saying, show me proof that there isn't a God, Todd. So Todd sends an email that says, the proof that there is a God, utterly fails to present any proof that there is a God, winds up contradicting himself, blames his God for me and allowing me to do all this stuff, and then ends it by shifting the burden of proof to suggest that instead of asking for proof of God, I should be asking for proof that there is no God. Well, Todd, I'm sorry that nobody's ever explained to you how the burden of proof works and how if we were to operate under your burden of proof, we would be required to believe in all of the gods until they had been disproved. And so if we use your model of waiting until you prove that there is no God, you would have to believe in Allah and Jesus and Yahweh and um, all of the various gods from all of the various religions, Ganesh, uh, I'm not even going to bother continuing to list them. That's what would have to happen under your model of the burden of proof, which is why I'm much happier using my model, which is I'm going to reserve judgment on whether or not something exists until there's sufficient reason to reach that conclusion. When it comes to the notion that there's a God existing somewhere outside of space and time, who's a governor of everything and a creator of everything, who cares who I have sex with and what my life is like, there isn't sufficient evidence to reach that conclusion. And you, Todd, have utterly failed, failed to pre present any, despite the fact that you tried to claim that my mere existence is proof of God. Our education system has failed Todd, and it's failed many other people. We allow, and we should allow, free speech, free expression, freedom of religion. And so the apologists and the evangelists who are sharing and spreading this notion of God, that God is just... Well, obviously true. The atheists are just silly. These are people who don't understand the basics of how we know what we know. These are the people who don't understand the basics of what we should believe and why. They don't understand skepticism, critical thinking, the nature of evidence, epistemology. They don't understand a syllogism. They don't understand a fallacy. They don't understand the significance of a fallacy. They don't understand that a fallacious argument doesn't mean the proposition is false. They don't understand where the burden of proof should rest. They don't understand that we don't freely choose our beliefs, just like, oh, I think I'll believe this today. I think I'll believe that today. They just don't understand anything of any significance or importance when it comes to the nature of belief and what is and should be believable. And that's why I get emails that say, the proof of God, that do the exact opposite. And so for each Christian out there who's watching this video, if, thank you, first of all, for making it this far. I appreciate you reading through that. If that doesn't represent your views on Christianity, you can call one of the many, many shows I do, Atheist Experience, The Hang Up, whatever. But 
do yourself a favor. Bring your A game. And if you don't have one, you should ask God what God wants you to say to me. Because God clearly did not want Todd to say this to me. God clearly knew how to think. If God exists, he would know how to think more rationally and reasonably than Todd does. And so before you call, ask God what you should say. And then call in and tell me. Because if God tells you, I want you to say this to Matt, I want to hear it. Genuinely. Look at my face. If God has a message for me, I genuinely want to hear it. And it should be that God will give you the message that makes it clear to me that this message is coming from God. Because God can definitely convey, if he exists, a message that makes it clear to me that it's from him. And if he can't do it through you, maybe his messengers should stop sending me messages and God can show up himself. This happens over and over again. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.